Thank you for joining us again this morning. We're covering does the mint thing really work? Doing some myth busting. There is an idea and some people swear by it. So is it a myth or does it really work that these mint candies actually scare the hive beetles right out of your hive? So let's get in there, have a look. We put them in last week and see if there's any hive beetles in this hive. So first of all, I could have a look from here. Whoa, hive beetles everywhere. A lot more hive beetles than before. That's interesting. Uh, <laughs> doesn't bode very well. Okay, hive beetle here. Now this hive didn't have many hive beetles, so um, I thought it might be a dud test, but here we are with hive beetles already. Now, could have the mints scared them right oh there they are inside the frame so it's not boding well another one there you can see a bee is holding it hostage down the bottom of the cell there just in front of my finger so there you go straight away it looks like we've got more high beetles than we had last week after putting the mints in let us know if it works for you does the mint thing really work also, shoot your questions in the comments below and we'll get to answering those as we go. Trace will be reading them out. So put your questions in and we will answer them as we do an inspection to double check what's going on in here. See if the mints are still there or whether the bees have chewed them away. So we're blowing a little smoke into the hive. This is a pretty calm hive, doesn't need a whole lot of smoke. So that'll do and we're going to take off the gabled roof and make sure we put our bee suit on sometimes i forget with this hive it's so calm but good practice put your bee suit on okay next make sure you do up the center zip first then the two side zips then the velcro good idea to get well protected Sometimes your bees can be grumpy. Smoking your hands if you're going gloveless is not a bad idea. Okay, next we're going to crack off this top box and just leave it on the ground. To do that, we've got our hive tool here and we're just lifting the corners, going around, lifting each corner like that. Now it's nice and free. This is a good handle and away we go. Okay, I'm just gonna put that on the ground on its end. Oh, they didn't like that so much. Perhaps I should have used a little more smoke. Might give them a little more here. Notice they gave me a few little warnings. Okay. Maybe the uh, mints have upset them. Who knows, this hive's always been incredibly calm. Okay, next we're going to peel off the queen excluder and have a look in each corner where we put those mints and see if there's anything remaining. Any questions put it in the comments also let us know whereabouts in the world you are tuning in from. So here we go. The theory is that the, the, uh, the mint in those candies actually scares the hive beetles right out of the hive. I can see no trace of the mint. So the bees have pretty quickly chewed those mints away. So it was a week ago that we put them in. So who knows, perhaps it scared the, mint, the hive beetles away for a couple of days. And once they cleared out the mints, they came back. Let us know what you think, whether it's myth or whether you think it works. And also ask your questions in the comments below. So we saw straight away there was plenty of hive beetles in this hive, more than last week, so we suspect it's a myth. But it's only a test of one. So if you want to test this, these are the mints people are talking about. These mint candies. And have a look at last week's video as to how to put them into the hive. Okay, adding a little smoke. And we're going to pull out a frame, but before I do that, I'm going to click on our frame rest just on the outside here 
and they make a nice little rest for our frame to sit on which will be helpful when Callum is filming as well so I can show you what's going on in the frame. Sideways first if you can to get a frame out and we're going to be looking for high beetles as we go we're also just generally going to be looking in at the amazing world of bees if there's anything particular you've got questions about please put it in the comments and we'll see if we can find an example of it right inside the hive here so I'm slowly coming up slowly on the first frame because you don't want to roll bees between the two frames that's it okay what have we here we've got this frame where the comb guide fell down you can see it there not to worry still working very nicely these bees have done a great job of drawing the natural comb you can see all of their brood that's the cap brood there and often people are wondering the difference between worker brood and honey here's a nice example of it that is the worker brood and that is the honey. See the difference there? You've got translucent patches in it, you've got nectar glistening down cells on the uncapped parts. And it's kind of a little bit darker brown and doesn't have that slight see-through sense that the wax has. Beautiful. And just I might just have a quick look over this comb. Just want to have a look for the queen because I don't really want to leave her outside the hive. Can't see her strutting around on that frame. Good. Okay, and we've got a bit of pollen here. I'll show you the pollen. It's actually the bee bread. So they've got their pollen, they've brought it back, they've squashed it into the cells with their heads and added their special sauce and now it's fermenting away turning into bee bread like a good sourdough you can see oranges and whites down there and that's their bee bread give us a thumbs up if you can see the bee bread down the cells beautiful any questions coming through Yes, Ada. Um, Vanessa's actually asking, just wondering about the uh, myth busting. Just wondering, was, is there any evidence maybe in the pest tray? And do you think, are there any more beetles, more beetles than there were? In the pest so tray? I'm just wondering if there's some, any sign of the mint. Not a bad idea. Okay, no beetles in the pest tray, but we didn't put oil down there. Oh, there's one. One beetle in the pest tray there. And no sign of the mints. No sign of the mints, so the bees consume those mints. I'm going to squash that little beetle. Sorry about that. I didn't mean to be in the wrong place in the world. Okay, so that's a typical yeah. pest tray look where you've got lines here representing the each frame. You can see that. And the little bits that they're chewing off are falling. So that those little bits of chewings, if you go in, are actually the little capping bits as they uh, the new bees emerge. Sometimes you'll see a lot of these little cylindrical cappings of a brood cell and that shows you that there's a whole lot of new uh, baby bees emerging into the hive. So this hasn't been cleaned out in a while. You can also see it's a little bit of um, mold or something there that's perfectly normal and if we wanted to use it for catching hive beetles we'd clean that up and we'll put some oil in there and that will block the breathing on the hive beetle and they will drown also will drown bees as well so you've got to be careful that bees aren't getting into this area to do that we want to make sure that a lot of bees haven't run in underneath there perhaps you can see that uh, and underneath you can see the screen just quick check of that if you're using this for trapping hive beetles and you put this tray back in so by sliding it in and the next thing to do is make sure your vented cover is pressed right up against the frame otherwise it could leave a gap for the bees these little L screws should be tight against that 
uh, vented cover to make sure it's pressed in. Any right. more questions? Yeah, Cedar, um, interesting, Bob, uh, Tina and Bob have tuned in and they are in Bonnells Bay, beautiful Bonnells Bay, not sure where that is, but it sounds beautiful. They, they use sugarless Tic Tacs in the pest tray and it seems to work and they're wondering maybe locating the, the, the lollies lower might have helped as well. So they, do, they use sugarless Tic Tacs in the pest tray. Sugarless Tic Tacs, yeah. okay. Another, uh, another one to try. Now, if we put those mints in the tray, the bees wouldn't have been able to chew them up. So perhaps that's the next thing to try. But on your advice, let's try the sugarless Tic Tacs. We'll put them in the tray and we'll see if it scares the beetles right out of the hive. Would be very nice if it did. <laughs> I reckon. And Joe, Joe's asking, I'm not sure where Joe is, but saying it's very humid. Sounds like he could be down the road from us because it's very humid here. And just wondering, you put some foam insulation on the top cover, but still seem to be getting cons... Con condensation in the windows is that okay okay condensation is a perfectly normal thing in a beehive in fact in the colder times when the bees aren't going out to forage they'll use it as a water source so all over the walls of the hive in fact some people say you better not to insulate the box because you want the condensation on the walls of the hive so the bees can use that when they're not flying as their water source. What you don't want is a lot of condensation building up on the inner cover, on the underside of the inner cover and dripping onto the bees because wet bees, when it gets cold, uh, it's not a good thing, they might perish. So what people do in those colder places is they'll insulate the inner cover by putting some stuffing in the gabled roof. So that uh, it's less likely to build up any condensation on the underside of the inner cover. But condensation down the inside walls is fine. As your bees uh, build up a bit more, you'll notice that will come and go. If it's full of bees, uh, you, you get less condensation on the viewing window. So I wouldn't worry about it, is the short answer. Great. Okay. No. I'm need Fruini Cedar to spot that queen for you. Yeah, exactly. She's very good at spotting queens. I spend too much time talking, not enough time <laughs> looking for the queen, but I wanted to have a quick look because I'd rather her not be orphaned from the hive. I could just shake the bees in. That would be another way to go to make sure. So if you want to get bees off a frame, a short, sharp shake like this. And that gets most of the bees off. Now from there, if you want to get the last bees off, you can actually just use a bee brush or some foliage to brush them off. Now, this frame is quite empty. So let's just have a look at what is going on here with this frame. I don't remember seeing that last week. Okay, brushing those bees away. Now we can get a really good look at what's going on down the cells. And have a look for any bee eggs. Now, you do need to get some sharp eyesight. So if you wear glasses, make sure you put your glasses on for this. The clear view hood that we've made really does help. Instead of looking through that mesh, you're looking at a very clear picture. And if you pull it back towards your face a bit, then you get less reflection. So we've made that modification up there. We've also put an anti-fog coating on it. So that makes it a lot nicer to see. And what I'm seeing is larvae down the cells. Give us a thumbs up if you can see the young larvae down the cells. A little crescent moon grub at the bottom, covered in royal jelly, which is what they feed them at first. It's like mother's milk excreted from the bees. Okay, so that's good. So although this looks like an empty frame, it's not. It's full of the first stage of the bees, the, the larvae stage. So that's a good thing. Lots of larvae across here 
I'm just having a look to see if I can see any eggs. I'm not seeing them, so it's interesting. But I don't think it'll be long before the queen comes back here and lays a few eggs. There is a couple up in this region. Very hard to see. Okay, so they can go back in now. Or we could just put it here to have more space in the hive. Any more questions? Yeah, see the Sally's asking, they had um, some flow frames and they just neglected them a bit. So I gave them a bit of a clean out and they're all looking good. But just having problems encouraging um, the bees to go back into the flow frames. Got any tips on that? Okay, the very best thing is lots of bees and a good nectar flow and your bees will be very quick to get in there. So it, you can uh, change that. If you've got other boxes on the hive, you might want to take some of them off so that there's lots of bees in the flow frame box. Otherwise, you'll just simply have to wait for a good nectar flow and the bees to build up for them to occupy that area. So reduce the size of your hive and that will help and if they've already been used and you've cleaned them up then there's no need to put any more wax on them it's just probably a game of patience before they start really working them okay a lot of brood here very good to see you get that clockwork brood it's amazing because every single cell there is going to be a fluffy baby bee emerging into the hive in the next 11 days so the population's just going to get bigger and bigger here, which is neat. Same on the other side, we've got brood in this area, and then young larvae down the cells here. Just the thumbs up if you can see the larvae, the white grubs down the cells. I'll see if I can get the sun angle on it like that, so you can see that larvae. But being a naturally drawn comb, I don't want to tilt it over too much further or we might actually get into an issue. You can see the tilt actually uh, bulged it out. You can see that wobble there. There's no wire or uh, plastic or wax foundation in the center. It's just as they've drawn it, this was a swarm that we shook into this box and this is what they built. Aren't they incredible? So they were empty frames just with the wooden comb guide at the top. Any more questions? Yeah, see the Gail's wondering what type of bees we have in this hive. So you've always got a bit of a mix around here because the unless you're buying in a mated queen, what you'll have is a whole bunch of uh, drones mating with the queen up to say 30 or more. And that means you might get uh, a bit of a mix from different hives, but the Apis mellifera, which is a European honeybee, and a lot of what you've got in here is the Italian bee, the more golden looking ones. Bee breeders often say they're a great starter bee, they can be nice and gentle and uh, a, a, a good forager. And then others will say, no, the Carnolians are the ones to get because they'll forage a bit further. The Caucasian ones, the, the black one might, might be uh, said to throttle to the nectar flow a bit more so better at surviving when the scarce nectar there's all of these traits the bee breeders will breed for as well as hygienic behavior gentleness and productivity so uh, often you just get what you get but if you go to a bee breeder and get a mated queen and ask for something specific then what the things you you'll be asking for are a nice gentle strain and Hygienic, they're the two main things you want. So they're better at cleaning pests and diseases out of their hive. Ideally, you want the bees to take care of things and for them to look after themselves. But as we know, sometimes there's issues and you need to intervene. Okay, we can keep looking through this hive. Any more questions? Nice. Cedar John's just um, tuned in just down the road at Coffs Harbour. Just wondering if it's too late to perhaps add an extra brood box or a super. Okay, there, it's not too late to add an extra 
brood box? I don't think so, not in our area. If you're on the coast there, you will get a lot of um, probably the paper barks and things. Like it just started to flower yesterday around here and we can smell it coming into my apiary at home. Lots of sickly sweet paper bark smells and they'll go right through the winter. So generally the autumn on the coast, on the east coast of Australia here, is a pretty good time to be beekeeping. So, and even into the, uh, even through the winter. So you can go ahead and add more boxes if your bees are crowded. Now, bearing in mind that there is a, a red zone from the Varroa mite uh, there around Coffs Harbour. So make sure you are following the DPI rules in that area. Um, still battling the mite in a number of places. Okay, a lot of brood again, so this hive's going to absolutely explode. And also make sure you are following the rules of doing your six weekly alcohol washes here in New South Wales and reporting because ideally we can get rid of that pesky mite and and uh, not have to deal with them. However, it's not the end of the world if we get the mites. We just join the rest of the world with the treatments and things they do to keep the mites at bay. Okay, look at that, lots of brood. And we've got drone brood down here. See these ones that stick out? They're the drones which have a 24 day gestation instead of a 21. So they're a bit bigger bee, take a bit longer and they'll be emerging out of there with their big black eyes and bigger bodies. There's a drone, I'll just find a spot here. Here's a drone here, and you can see the difference between that bigger bee and the little bees next to it. See that? It's the drone. Easy way to spot it when you're beginning is the eyes touch together in the center. See that? The eyes just touch together in the center there. Now drones don't have a stinger, so they're a good one to practice picking up. But we'll let you just go back into the hive there. Cedar, Sue's just up the road at the Gold Coast and just got a question. If you've got excess honey frames in your brood box, just wondering what we do. Do we extract them like in the, the old way or do we just leave them in there? So. I just leave them in there for the bees, I can't be bothered extracting in the old way. But every now and then you might have a reason to get out some honeycomb, perhaps you're having a party or you've got a cheese platter you want to make. And what you might do is just take, just pull one of these frames up and just cut out some of the comb and put it straight back in. And that way you've got that beautiful honeycomb and the bees will pretty quickly just fill that in. Have a look at this beautiful pollen here. But if you just leave it there and you've got plenty of room in the top box, as the bees need it, they'll move that honey upstairs. So I wouldn't bother purposefully taking it out for the reason of uh, manipulating the bees for, for, for better health. But if you want to get it for honeycomb, then by all means get in there and take some of the edge frames that are just honey. Cedar, um, Giselle's asked a question, and in fact, Sue's already answered it, but I thought you might want to do it anyway, because I think a lot of people are interested in this. How do you attach those brackets on the side of that box? Okay, so they are just simply the same brackets we use for harvesting, the dual purpose for a frame rest. Now, all you need to do is back out one of those little screws, and the best way I've found is you go over the screw and down, the keyhole and um, actually twist it into position. So you start a bit on an angle or on the side over the screw and then twist it into position. Now sometimes you've got to fiddle around to get the, the right adjustment on your screw but that's pretty easy to do and once you've set it up it's set there for next time. So handy little brackets they are and make it make a very nice little little frame rest. Once you've got two or three frames out, you've got plenty of room in your hive then to manipulate the frames. And there's really no need to take any more of them out. Okay. Right. 
Jeff and Joe, we've got a lot of locals tuning in today down at Grafton, which isn't too far away, about to do their first honey harvest, so getting pretty excited. And just a question about, do they need to inspect the flow frames um, just to check that they are full of honey, even if the ends of them look like they are full of honey? Okay, it's a good question. Now, the smoke is just running out of smoke, so what I might do is just top that up a little bit. Now, it's very hot, so I'm going to use the hive tool to actually press it down. There we go. Pine needles I'm using, they burn pretty quickly, but they're very easy to light. So, and we've just happened to have some pine trees here. So a good one for us to use. You use always your... make that look so easy, Cedar. When I'm doing it at home, I tell you, it's never that easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you're good with that hive tool. Well, well you can see I, I haven't done a great job of poking <laughs> in <laughs> the, the, frac the the rest here. I've got to spend a little bit more time getting it in so the lid can close. We'll close over a little bit, but that was just getting too much. Okay, now that should fire up. So your question about the frames, do you need to inspect yeah. them? So the short answer is once you get a good idea of what's going on in your hive by looking in the windows, you don't need to inspect them because the idea is you can look in, see when the frames are full and simply harvest the honey in an easy, gentle way. Now, having said that, you do get some bees that will do some tricky things and maybe not fill the extremities of the frames. So sometimes you can have full frames, but you're not seeing the honey in the end window. So. If you suspect that's going on, get in there and have a look. So the long answer is familiarise yourself with the frames and what this view looks like and what's going on inside. Now, if I was watching the bees filling here and each time you look back, you'll see a different pattern here. And if you see it's expanding and filling and you're seeing honey in this end frame and they're starting to cap it off, then start harvesting them because if they're, if they're in a filling mode, then these frames will be full, okay? But then if you get into a hungry time where your bees are quite hungry and you'll see a kind of checkerboard pattern here where there's a full one, empty one, full one, empty one, and you might see them eating away some of the honey in the side windows as well. If that happens, then it's not the best time to harvest because even though you might be seeing full honey frames in the center of the box here, they might have eaten some of the honey away directly above the brood nest. Now not the end of the world if you harvest and you don't get a full jar, the bees will be okay still, but better if you can recognize when the bees are bringing in lots of, of nectar and storing a lot of honey and that's the time to harvest. Um, otherwise you might be disappointed that you know, the bees have eaten a bunch of the honey away from some of these frames, especially in the centre. Um, but yeah, as you tune in and watch what the bees are doing in these windows, you'll get a good idea of when it's time to harvest or not. And you won't need to take the hive apart. But by all means, if you want to, get in there and have a look. We really encourage people to experiment and learn and get in and do some beekeeping. Great. Right. Interesting, um, seed on that question that Gail asked about what type of bees. Gail's in um, Trinidad and Tobago and says there are two types and Trinidad has Africanised bees but Tobago has European bees. Uh -huh. So Africanised bees um, I don't have experience with but let us know what they're like. I've heard they're, they're very aggressive but they do keep pests away and can look after themselves better. So let us know what you do. Um, I think if you've got um, quite a lot of that genetics, then they're pretty wild bees, but let us know what they're like um, for you if you keep Africanized bees. Nice. Um, Abdu's asking, do we have a family name for our bees? Uh -huh. <laughs> what, well, this one's Bertha, that's the queen. So each one's named after, after uh, a different queen. This is um, Queen Elizabeth II. And um, this one's, uh, <laughs> not really actually. No, <laughs> the Anderson. But we could. <laughs> we could, maybe we need a family name. 
So to, Tara's just asking, the dark capped honey that sometimes looks really black and they have a lot of it. Just wondering, is, that, is it normal to look like that, that really dark one? Oh, that's a wonderful thing about, about beekeeping is all the different types of honey and the flow frames allow you to really isolate them. You might get a dark honey here, then a really light one there. No honey showing at the moment because the bees are a bit hungry, but hopefully it'll come in again. And, and we might have harvested these ones, but not these ones. So next time we'll fill up with a different type of nectar producing a different colored honey. And it's just a beautiful thing. So a lot of people love the dark honey and I get honey that you cannot even see through. It's black, so it's incredible to have that variation from the black honey to the very light, almost um, just, just a very light straw-coloured honey. And yeah, it's just wonderful. So the dark honey is not an issue. It's a wonderful thing to have that variation and be able to share that story and bring that honey to the table. I don't have any examples here, just a little bit of the lighter-coloured honey that we get in the springtime here. Nice. Um, Paul from the Sunshine Coast just discovered a large amount of like, it looked like brown sugar dust, brown sawdust rather, um, like material in the bottom of the tray. Checked the hive and found that a large amount of the cells were being eaten out. Just wondering if that's normal. Okay, so the, what you need to identify is whether you still have a laying queen. Sometimes you can get into a situation where it looks like bees are coming and going from your hive, but your hive is actually a dead out, as in uh, there is no colony in there anymore apart from robber bees coming to chew away the wax and, and steal the remaining honey. So you can get a whole lot dropping from that. Uh, but if you're seeing brood and things in here, then it's not an issue. It's simply that the bees are doing a lot of remodeling of wax and that those little bits of wax are falling through into your tray. Nice. Hobo Gold um, in Victoria, one thinking might be a bit short on honey stores for winter. Just wondering what's the good, what's the sugar mix that you should use for the bees in winter time? Okay, so in winter time, generally people use a thick syrup. So, if um, I mean, there's all different things. And tune in next week. We're going to do a winter-specific uh, beekeeping topic with a special guest, and we'll see if we can stream from two sides of the planet and specifically focus on wintering. But. We don't really have a winter here, so we don't really need to uh, feed the bees at all. But should you have bees that are hungry and you've got a long, cold winter ahead, then by all means, feeding them prior to winter is the best thing to do. And you'll be going two to one, two parts sugar, one part water, and filling up. Um, we've, got, we've got videos on how to quickly make a feeder. You can put syrup in a Ziploc bag and put some pinholes, put it on top of the inner cover the bees will come up through the plug if you take that out and suck on that sugar syrup. Another way you can do it is the upside down jar with the nail holes in the lid so you can quickly and easily make a feeder to feed your bees prior to a long cold winter so if you're in the southern parts of Australia you might need to do that soon to make sure they've got enough stores in order to survive the winter ahead if you do have a weak colony with not many stores. The um, and other beekeepers will be using uh, like a fondant feed that they can actually chew on as an emergency and they'll put that up in the roof cavity for the bees to go up and collect during the winter if they've got a lot of snow to, to wait out until they get going again. So quite a, quite a few options there, but two to one is the one is the ratio if you want to, so two parts sugar, one part water, if you want to feed them uh, a, a syrup that they're going to store. And one to one ratio if you want to feed them a nectar-like syrup which will be stimulating them to start laying eggs. So that's a, a simulating a honey flow coming on in the springtime. Commercial beekeepers will do that to build up the population prior to a big flowering that's coming and that'll be a one-to-one -one ratio. Oh, great. Um, so did Monique notice some chalk brood in the bottom of the hive? Just wondering what would be the best way to deal with that. Okay, so chalk brood 
is a pathogen that's quite prevalent in, in, in beekeeping. It's a, um, it's a fungus and it can be collected off leaves and whatever out in the wild and the bees bring that back into the hive. Now some bees will just get on top of it and kick it out because they have the hygienic trait to do so and other bees it can get hold of in the hive and you end up with a whole lot of mummified little young bees falling to the bottom and as you say seeing them in the tray. I wouldn't worry if your infection's quite mild but if you're getting lots and lots and you see a whole lot of mummies being dragged out of the hive if you get there in the early morning on the landing board then there's a few things to do. One is move your hive into the sun and that will help just relieve that damp kind of uh, fungus producing environment. It, and the next thing will be a bit of airflow. So get, get your vented cover on this way, allow a bit more airflow in the hive. Then beyond that, um, the next thing to do will be replacing the queen if you've still got chalk brood issues. And hopefully next time you get some genetics that will be more hygienic and kick out that chalk brood. And if you're going through that process at the same time, you might be, uh, cutting out some of the, some of the old ch uh, chalk brood wax in the hive to lessen the, the amount of spores in the hive as well. So try all those things and see how you go. I see to just back on that sugar one again, just wondering is it white sugar or raw sugar? Or what sugar? Always white sugar, never raw sugar. There's uh, some things in raw sugar that shouldn't be fed to bees. Nice. Now, Brad's asking, will a hive produce either swarm cells or supersedure cells without the presence of drones? Without the presence of drones, yes. The, they, there can be no drones in a hive and they can still raise queens. So they will go ahead and do swarm cells, supersedure cells. They're both uh, queen cells, but the um, Supersedure uh, cells, um, uh, swarm cells are usually around the edge and at the bottom, and the supersedure cells are more towards the centre. And emergency cells will be made just by turning an existing queen cell into a queen cell by extending it. So you've got a few types of queen cells there to look out for, but basically. Most of the time the bees just do their thing and they know what to do best in terms of whether they need to uh, raise a new queen or not. In springtime you'll find they will generally be uh, making a few cells and a few queen cells in, in case they want to swarm and that's the time to get in there and do your spring management. Open up some space in the brood nest by cutting out some of the comb or taking a, a split. Great. John's wondering if it would ideally should there be two deeps and one flow frame so that would allow food for the bees and enough honey for you. Some people would like to do two deeps so two brood boxes and one flow super on top. Other people like to do two flow supers and one brood box. I like to keep it just like this because it's easier if you have to find the queen you've only got one brood box to look through and uh, there's enough cells in here for a large size hive if you add them all up, if all of these are being used for brood. What I find if you add another brood box, certainly in this area, then they don't use it all. As you say, they'll use it a, a lot for honey. Now, typically in the colder areas, you do need some more honey stores. So if you've got a long cold winter ahead, then you might like to add a, another brood box, as you say, just to have more uh, honey storage in there for the bees to survive that winter. But equally you'll go around the corner in that cold area and another beekeeper will be running them just like this. So get a few opinions. Um, it's certainly a bit easier to keep your hive smaller but on the drawback you do need to do your spring management otherwise they're more likely to swarm than having more than if they have more space in the hive. So taking splits, uh, making room in the brood nest in the springtime if you are running a smaller hive like this.
Nice. Now, Giselle's asking, and I think what they're talking about is the vented cover. Just wondering which way is the airflow, and which way is for winter, and which way is for the summer? So vents up allows airflow up above the tray. So that's the way to remember it. The airflow goes up above the tray, so the vents go up in the summertime. And you can spin that around and push this up against that tray there, and that will limit airflow for the winter time. Having said that, it, uh, even in uh, Europe where they have long cold winters, some beekeepers will be running screen bottom boards with no tray in at all, and they say the bees are fine with just an open mesh bottom board in the snow. So they may not need uh, you to turn that over and limit the airflow, but it's a personal preference really. Um, Dee, we're getting a few questions now on that brood box. So uh, Tara's asking, would it be all right to put another brood box on now? And I'm not quite sure um, where Tara is, but also if you did, would you, what frames would you move up from the bottom box into that second brood box? Ah, good, that's a great question. So here, we could add another brood box if we want to, just about any time of year, especially if we predict there's some flowers coming up. So it really depends where you are in the world. Now, if you are going to add another brood box and you are using naturally drawn combs like this, just with the comb guide at the top and letting the bees draw their comb, then put it underneath this one. So lift this off, put it underneath. Reason is, the bees will then hang down and build their comb nice and straight. If you just put it on top with naturally drawn frames, they might decide to come up from the bottom, building onto some of this burr comb that's already on top of the frames, and then you could get a, a wonky mess. The other thing you could do is checkerboard it. So you could put uh, existing frame, new frame, existing frame, new frame, like that, and that would um, get them to go straight as well so that's another thing you could do you could split them i don't need to do that if it's warm in your area because you'll be really breaking up that brood nest and cooling down the brood so if it's cold keep your brood together in the center of the box and don't checkerboard it like that right and tara's actually in canberra who was asking that question so uh, a yes. little bit further south than we are you certainly get some cold days there in canberra i've, I've got uh got two uncles uh, and a grandfather who's 96 all keeping bees in Canberra and my cousins. So um, ah. good area for beekeeping, get that beautiful yellow box honey, I still remember it even as I say it, the smell and the flavour comes straight back to me. So I love those inland flavours of honey. Nice. And, and just on that, that brood box, how long do you think that would take then to establish it and would you take the super box off? If you're going to add a second brood box now. If you're going to add a second brood box, would you take the super box off? Now, if you're in Canberra, um, you'd be doing that as a strategy for just storing some honey in some conventional frames prior to the winter for the bees. Now, that could be a good strategy. You could take the super off and put a conventional box on, hoping that they fill it up. The other thing you could do is just remove the excluder and leave your flow hive super on all winter and that way the ball of bees will go up and consume the honey in the flow frames. They will stop laying as it gets colder and come springtime when they start laying again you'll just need to shake all the bees downstairs to make sure the queen is in the bottom box and put your excluder back in place. So whether you're using a conventional hive or a flow hive Good idea to take out that excluder for the winter, otherwise your queen could be left behind as a ball of bees goes up to consume the honey and she'll perish and you'll start the spring with no queen. So a um, few options there, you could certainly add another box and take the flow super away. If you do that, the best thing to do would be to store it away from vermin, preferably in a freezer, so you can just put them straight back on with no clean up later. Or you could leave it on, take the excluder out and let the bees consume the remaining honey in the flow frames. Nice. Debbie from Bega Cedar is asking, can the, the basin uh, pest management tray with the legs and the ant cap, will that fit on the classic hive? It will, it will. So Trace can sort you out with one of those. There's a slight difference here, a bit of a legacy issue. 
from the way we started with uh, we're slightly narrower with the flow hive too so you'll, you'll find that there'll be just a slight step in but you'll hardly notice it often as you can see here there's a step in already simply by the alignment of the boxes so it'll look at just a little bit like that between the your brood box and the stand underneath. So if you've got a, a box of bees, can you make your own queen? Absolutely. My sister's been making queens at my place and Pete, who you see here, has also been raising queens and Farweenie, who was on here last week, she raises queens. So there's all sorts of great um, techniques to get hives to raise queens. But one of the easiest ways when you get started is simply take a split, make sure there's eggs in one of the frames, you leave the queen behind and the split will raise its own queen when it recognises there isn't a queen in that split you've taken. So that's an easy way to get started. In fact, with that method, you don't even need to work out, you don't even need to find the queen because as long as you have a frame with eggs in both hives, the new split and the parent hive, then the one without a queen usually will raise a new one. Check back in, uh, in three weeks time and see if they have done so. Nice. Oh, Miller's in um, Western Australia. Sounds wheat, near a wheat belt and a, and a reserve full of wildflowers. Doesn't that sound gorgeous in springtime? Just wondering, should they wait for the end of winter to start the hive or can they do it now? Winters get pretty cold there so in WA. Okay, so WA, we're still just in the start of our autumn here, so I hazard a guess, but ask your local beekeepers that you'll be able to start a hive this time of year, especially if you're starting from a nucleus, which is an already going hive. Now, another way to start is you go and buy a, a whole brood box full of bees, in which case they look just like this, and you can just move that hive to your place. There isn't any restrictions there in WA about moving hives, so you can go ahead and do that and get started. And then you can transfer those in to your flow hive when time allows. Uh, in terms of the best time to start in WA, if you are getting very cold winters, then as you say, you might wanna wait for spring if you haven't got any going in the autumn. So it depends a little bit, but here spring starts quite early, sort of midway or the last month of winter. You'll be taking your splits and getting your hives going then. So ask your local beekeepers, find out whether you can get started now. We've got time for a few more questions as we put this hive back together. And I just smelt the paper bark, which is wonderful. Oh. It's been sickly sweet at home, but I haven't smelled that fragrance here yet. But here it is, some of these hives have just found the paper barks flowering down in, in the valley below here and they're bringing that back into the hives, which is exciting. We should get a bit of a pick up with our bees and some honey to harvest from the paper barks as the uh, autumn and winter comes. Nice. Um, how often should you do a brood inspection like you're doing now, Cedar, as we head into winter here in Australia? So if you're in New South Wales, the, the requirement currently is you'll be inspecting every six weeks to do your mite count with the alcohol wash. For the rest of the state, uh, it's beekeeping as normal, which is getting in your hive at least a couple of times a year and going through each frame, checking for pests and disease. Or if you see a downturn in the bee numbers or something like that, you might need to get in there and on a more as needed basis. Other parts of the world have different requirements, so find out how often you might need to keep bees if you're in another continent, how often you need to, sorry, do your brood inspections. Uh, usually if you're in a, in, a, in a continent with the varroa mite, you'll be doing a bit of mite management, which will get you in there uh, doing more brood inspections in the springtime. So if you go to harvest honey and you've got a little bit still left in the little trough, no, <laughs> that's what they've called it here, yep. um, what, can you eat that honey or is it best to let it flow out first? Okay, so if you've got a, a little bit of honey, oh, here's, a, it, yeah. here's a perfect example. So what I think you're talking about is this little bit of honey that sometimes builds up 
Some hives yes, some hives no, depending on how well the bees seal the flow frame parts. Now, as whether you can eat it or not, depends on how long it's been there and whether you're in a humid climate. If you're in a humid climate and it's been there a while, it could be fermented. So just have a little taste, you'll pretty quickly know whether it tastes good or not. And if it's not good, then just put your tube in there and let that bit drain out prior to harvesting. Now a little bit in a whole jar of honey won't make much difference because it's just a, a slight um, uh, fermentation in amongst a, a, a big jar of honey. But nevertheless, if you do want to clean it out prior to harvest and it's not tasting good, that bit of honey that's left in the trough area, then as I said, just let it drain out. Or if you want to take it a step further, you can get a kitchen wipe, one of those thin chucks, wet that, put it on your flow key and just insert it in and turn that around. Not this one, but the actual flow key we use for harvesting and you can just clean it right out before you go if you want to. I'm going to start putting this hive back together now. Nice. See, this is, this is a good one for someone who doesn't really eat or like garlic. Leanne used some olive oil in the tray and realised it was garlic flavoured and just wondering now, will it hurt the bees? It would hurt you. Oh, evil stuff, but who knows, it might scare away the hive beetles. So yeah. Let us know how you go. Today we're doing myth busting, so we were checking whether this, these mints we put in would scare away the hive beetles. Now what we found is the bees had taken the mints and destroyed them and eaten them or whatever, but they disappeared and there was more hive beetles in them last week. So this test of one showed that it is a myth, but they were gone. So perhaps it did scare them away for a time and then the hive beetles came back again. Let us know how you go with the mint thing at home if you want to try that. Another person suggested putting the sugarless Tic Tacs in the tray. So that's another thing we can do some myth busting on. Uh, <laughs> as to whether garlic oil is a problem or something that's useful in the hive, let us know. I don't think you'll be able to scare your bees away. Once they've set up shop in here, they really don't want to go, no matter how smelly you've made your hive with all sorts of toxic um, timber treatments and whatnot, they'll stay to look after their babies. So I doubt they'll leave, but uh, let us know if it has any beneficial effects. See, so Dave's in Pennsylvania and wondering what would be your choice for mite control in the flow hive? Okay, so I've done very little in the way of mite control, but have a look at thebeekeeper.org and we have episodes dedicated to that by experts from around the world. It's uh, free to try that online course and it's also a great fundraiser. We've planted over a million trees so far and it's made to really take you from square one in beekeeping right through to a deep scientific knowledge. Gets rave reviews, check it out and there's some dedicated stuff to do with uh, varroa mite. Hopefully I don't need to learn too much about it because we'll kick it out of Australia but you never know we might be joining you with mite control techniques as well. If you're tuning in and you've got a, a, a good mite control technique, help by putting it in the questions below. Nice. Leanne's going to keep, keep us updated, Cedar, on the garlic in the flow hive. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Just wondering how long um, you can keep this hive open for? Like, is there a length of time or do you, is it the state of the bees or...? Oh. You could, you could keep it open for hours and it's not really an issue. Now, the, the only caveat on that is if it's a cold day, you don't want to get shocked to the uncapped larvae. So they are sensitive to cold. So that's when. Other bees might get a bit grumpy if left open for too long. This is a pretty friendly hive, although they're getting busier and busier. And they did show some slight protective tendencies this morning. So as your hive gets stronger, sometimes they do change their tune a bit too. But here, where it's on a nice and warm day, the short answer is you can keep them open for hours and it's not a problem. But don't do that on a cold day. Nice. 
This Eda, just with this hive, a couple of people asking how many brood frames are in this hive and then how many flow frames are on top of it. Yes, we've confused the world a little bit with that because <laughs> this is a standard eight frame hive. So this is a standard eight frame Langstroth hive with eight frames in it. But when it comes to flow frames, we've made the cells bigger because when bees are away from the brood nest, they like to make deeper honey cells. So that means you've got six flow frames in a standard eight size Langstroth hive. So we call it the flow six. And for the 10 frame size, which is this one, you'll see seven flow frames and we call that the flow seven. But the two standard sizes for beekeeping in the world so that you can ma uh, mix and match equipment if you need to. And a question said that actually I get asked quite a lot on the phone is like, why is it an eight and a ten frame? Like, is there a, is, what's that about? You know, it's uh, just a legacy issue from, from shipping boxes for shipping kerosene and whatnot back in the old days. And there was two standard sizes that got made. Mostly it was the ten frame size in the beginning. And a lot of beekeepers are sh uh, shifting to the eight frame size hive simply because it's a bit lighter to lift off the honey boxes off the top to do your brood inspections. But in the colder climates, people prefer the bigger hive, so there's a bit more honey storage for those long, cold winters ahead. So could Cedar, could you then make like a four and a five frame hive? Like uh, a smaller hive and, and less flow frames or? Certainly, if you want to just grab our flow frames, you can make up any size box you can. The beekeeper in WA, Peter Detchen, he liked to run sort of half size boxes with just five or so brood frames in the bottom and flow frames in the top and said he got more honey that way. And you'll be doing a lot of splits in the springtime because they'll be continually wanting to swarm through that time. But uh, he said you get more honey by running even smaller colonies. So. There you go, you can try what you like and see what works for you. Nice. Um, Courtney's asking, loves the flow hive by the way, but just getting a few gaps in the super that the bees can squeeze through. Any advice on how to close those gaps to keep it tighter? Um, gaps in the Courtney super. Courtney does have three flow hives and love them. So getting a few gaps in the super and it seems like the bees are coming out. Okay, so Likely you've got a gap under the frames here is, is what you're probably talking about or perhaps it's on the edge here. Now if it's on the edge, uh, just make sure that these are lined up nicely. So get in there and push them all to the front so you can get a nice flat window face across here. And that way you shouldn't have a gap on the edge unless you forgot to put in this little side strip which takes up that space there. You can see a side strip there. And if it's a gap under the frames here, then you've probably got our Aracaria box, which uh, is subject to more change in size with moisture. And if you are getting a gap presenting under the frames, then use one of the comb guides from one of these frames or any other suitable piece of material just to put under the frames there to block that area. Uh, short answer is, if you do find gaps that the bees are getting out, try and block them up. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's nice to be working at the back and harvesting without bees coming out. Obviously bees are getting out the other side at the entrance, but you don't really want them coming out other places if you can help it. And Cedar, with the metal strip um, that's, that's on those, are they basically to fill that gap and to hold those flow frames in place? The metal strips there, yes, because if you didn't weren't running an excluder, you'd just have a gap straight into the hive there without the strip. So, did that answer the question? Yep, that's so, good, because Courtney's basically saying, actually she's got the two pluses and it's a gap, um, where is it, on the sides, but she's gonna fill it in exactly like what you just said. Okay, there shouldn't so, be a gap on the side of the two plus. Yeah. Um, we, we haven't so found the, that before, so perhaps um, send in some photos and we'll try and work it out with you. It could be the case that some of these frames are overlapping and they need straightening out or that strip on the side isn't present. 
Nice. Well, you can hear the bees changing now, can't you? Yeah, they're really, uh, they're really getting back to that question. Perhaps we've had them open too long. Look at them. They're really getting a bit, bit um, agitated. So let's put them back together <laughs> while we answer a couple of last questions. And oh, we great. can say thank um, you to the bees for their show and tell. Yeah, Em's saying that um, they had a little gap um, under the frame in winter and they put softened wax in there. The gap disappeared in summer. Great. So, yeah, some wax could, could do the job. I mean, bees generally block up the gaps to the outside, so you find the bees will do it for you eventually as well. Um, Putra is asking... Um, wants to see the process of actually extracting the honey, but today we're just doing a brood inspection, Putra, so maybe we'll, when there's some more honey, we'll do another honey, honey harvest. Great, so stay tuned for a honey harvest in probably, um, not next week, but the week after. Let's do a honey harvest and show you that process, so make sure you come back and tune in. Have a look at this, we've got a lot of bees on the outside of the hive. I've got the brood frames back in now, but what I'm going to do is actually sweep some of them in so they're less likely to be getting around the corner as I'm trying to put the brood box on. So I'll just get my bee brush and I'm just going up and in like that. Right. And what we need to do is put our excluder back in place. So the excluder goes here and just try and seize the moment give that a little bit of a wriggle as we go down we've got a lot more bees than there has been in previous weeks so we don't want to squash any if we can help it but i'm going to seize the moment there while there's while there's none around the rim to put the honey super back on again there we go oh cheeky aren't they get my brush and do that again. Some smoke can help too. There we go. Callum's going to be talented with the camera and some smoke. Callum the camera dude on the smoke now. Good on you Callum. Let's get that moment and we're back on. Slide it all into position and we're good to go. And on top of that we'll put our gable. Last question. Last question. This is actually um, Calvin. It was about the, the when we were talking about the Trinidad and the Tobago bees. Just wondering, can bees cross breed into different colonies? Absolutely. So the, the mating flight goes something like this. A queen, when it's a virgin queen, which is usually in the first week of its life, it'll merge from the hive as a virgin. Now, it can't lay any fertilised eggs, any worker bees, until it's mated. So what it'll do, it'll take off on a mating flight. Now, to do that, she'll fly out and fly around the valley. And what she's looking for is a drone congregation area where you've got drones from all sorts of hives, not only from this apiary, but other apiaries as well, collecting together in an area. It's kind of like the pub, I guess. And uh, <laughs> the... Uh, Queen flies past and when she gets close enough, all of a sudden there could be a hundred drones after her and they'll be chasing her around. She flies fast so the drones are struggling to keep up. But when the first one manages to catch her, he'll mate with her. And then his genitals will be ripped off and he'll fall to his death. Next one comes along and digs out those genitals and mates with her again. And that might go on 30 times. And she will return back to the hive with enough sperm for up to six years of laying up to a couple of thousand eggs a day. So that's incredible. And when, they, when she does that, she's collecting genetics from not only your other hives, but hives from further afield. So yes, you'll get crossbreeding between your hives simply by the DNA being shared around by those drones. She may mate once more and then that'll be it for her entire life of laying. Thank you very much for tuning in. Have a look at thebeekeeper.org if you want a uh, in-depth training course made to take you from square one right through to a deep 
uh, even scientific knowledge. And um, also put your questions in below and ideas of what you want us to cover. If you've got any more myths you want us to bust, that's a fun topic to cover and to experiment with. Um, and I'm just going to mark down what happened in the logbook here because what we had was a whole lot of high beetle here that weren't even present last week. So unfortunately the mint thing didn't work for us here in this test of one, but let us know how you go.